So I want to talk about this blog post which I discovered the other day, which is titled as there are a lot of ways to break up long tasks in JavaScript. Now let's take a look at what these are, how you would be able to break up a long task with multiple things which are available. And uh, I would just try to add in few things which I probably know which could be helpful and relevant to the blog post itself. So first of all, let's try to understand what a long task is in general, right? So it's a task that you know, just takes up a long time. <laughs> for example, here's an example. We have a button for incrementing a count on the screen alongside a big old loop doing some hard work, right? So again, like you are incrementing a button on the count, but you are also running something in a loop. Now this could be anything right now. This example just wastes time, but this could be like calculating a prime number or this could be calculating, I don't know, Fibonacci series number, something like that, or something, whatever you want to use. So when you run this, nothing visually updates, not even the loop counter. That's because the browser never gets a chance to paint the screen. This is all you get, no matter how furiously you click. Only when the looping is completely finished, do you get any feedback, right? So what's happening over here is that you have a button count, you have a click count and a loop count. When you click on the button itself, you have a click count dot inner text is incremented, right? But while this event listener already is attached, even though you have an items with a array of 100 with null values and for every item you are incrementing the loop count but you are also synchronously waiting here's an important thing it's synchronously waiting so it's doing a lock on the main thread right so it's using a while loop which technically locks it on the main thread itself right so your main thread which is a ui thread which is also shared by javascript the dom all of that it's basically frozen that's why in the screenshot you see that the user tries to press this but there is no response from the browser because all of this is running in the main thread this is why you also can see sometimes that you know if you are playing a video for example i don't know if this is a video or an image this is an image if this was a video for example and i go in my inspector and press and write debugger for example you will see that all the other interactions if you were doing automatically pause right so let me just show you let me just give you an example of this let's say i'm on this video right which is over here so if i go ahead and if i click on if i go to my console and write debugger you will see that the main thread now is frozen. So if I scroll down, for example, you can see the comments are not loading, which is the typical behavior for YouTube. If I scroll down, you can see the images are not loading because this probably has been, has lazy loading on with JavaScript, right? So nothing is working, but the video is playing. That means that the video decoding and the playback by Chrome, the browser itself, is not part of the main thread itself because this debugger only pauses the JavaScript execution in the time. So now if I go ahead and play this, you're gonna see that the comments load, everything is working fine, the images start to load because again all of that is happening on the main thread the dev tools flame chart corroborates this the single task in the event loop takes five seconds to complete horrible right so the flame charts is a concept which you can use to further debug performance this is available in dev tools also the solution here is that if you have a very long task you just you know give the main thread some time, some breathing room to just do anything which is critical to user, right? The user input. This has also been the philosophy of React 19 in general, the suspension of the main thread and so on. So if you read a little bit about it, that's also what React 19 does. This is why it says that, you know, we can fire your user effect twice because I mean, not exactly this is the reason, but they also say that we based on the user input, let's say if somebody's touching the screen or, you know, scrolling, we will prioritize that as the first thing because the user expects to get a response extremely fast, right? If they are not getting a response, it'll be, it'll become an unresponsive application. So the similar thing you have to do, if you have a very long task, you have to somehow figure it out that how do you chunk it in such a way that it can be performed over time while giving some breathing room to the main thread, because the thread is same. All you can do is just spread out the task over a longer duration while you include other tasks for example button click or typing or you know screen scroll something like that so the first way is set timeout plus recursion so you can see over here if you use set timeout and call a function recursively with it you are able to get a system like this because set timeout does not immediately execute the task right it places the tasks on a queue which then is picked on the next tick of the event loop so you can see over here once you do something like this you will see that your UI becomes responsive. The loop starts to increase. That's completely fine. 
But because your JavaScript is not continuously executing on the main thread, this loop itself, which is not synchronously continuously waiting on the main thread itself for five seconds, that is 100 times 50 milliseconds. So it comes out to be five seconds. But you can also see that it's taking a lot longer than five seconds in this case, right? I mean, not a lot longer, but still you will feel like it's noticeably longer. So this is one way to do a task. The second way is using async await and a timeout. This combination allows us to abandon recursion and streamline things a bit. So you see over here, we have a similar code like we had earlier. So you do have a wait sync, you have a button dot add event listener, you have an async function now, which is like, I'm assuming this immediately gets invoked. Yeah, this, the indentation is a bit off, but you can see like it's an immediately invoked function. So over here, you do the same thing. You loop over, you increment the count, but instead of just waiting sync immediately, you just add a await new promise of a set timeout of zero. Now this is very smart because what it does is that it releases control just for just enough time so that the main thread itself comes back to life and it can just, you know, handle anything which is pending like a button click before it synchronously blocks the thread for 50 milliseconds. So mind you that if this is still happening, this 50 millisecond block is still happening. But the only thing that this line does is that it releases the main event control, main, main event thread so that your button clicks or other things can be handled. So you can see the explanation here that the promise then method is always executed on the micro task queue after after everything else on the call stack is finished. It's almost always an inconsequential difference, but worth noting nonetheless. So you can see over here, because this will not complete, the set timeout resolve will not complete until and unless the micro task queue has triggered, you effectively give it enough time on the main thread itself so that this button's click can be handled. So your response UI becomes responsive at least. Then there's another API, which is scheduler.postTasks. So it's uh, relatively new to Chromium browsers intending to be a first class tool for scheduling tasks with a lot more control and efficiency. It's basically a better version of what we have been relying on with set timeout to do us for decades. So it's a relatively new API. You can see it's not available in Firefox at all, not even in Safari. So you probably don't want to use it just yet on production, but nonetheless, it's something good to know about. So this API you can see comes with a few more things like priority, for example, so you can define user blocking as a priority or background as a priority and based on whatever you set over here, it would make it execute in that specific fashion. So the user blocking priority is intended for tasks critical to user experience on the page, such as responding to user input. As such, it's probably not worth using it for just breaking up big workloads. So you see this over here, the default set timeout and background set timeout runs first, then the default and then the background. Again, you can play around with this API to understand a bit more about how this exactly works. But like I mentioned, it's not well documented, well supported across browsers. It is documented, but you can polyfill it if you want. Then just like we have scheduler.postTask, there is a scheduler.yield. So this yield method of scheduler interface is used for yielding it to the main thread during a task and continuing the execution later with the continuation scheduled as a prioritized tasks. This allows long running work to be broken up so that browser stays responsive. Again, similar to what had been done here in a way or rather here also. So what it's effectively doing is yielding back the control to the browser, just like we did that with the promise call above, but it's again, it's more optimized. The author also gives an example so if you have a checkbox over here, which synchronously blocks the thread for a second, you will have an interface like this where you click on this, but it will freeze and then the checkbox will appear. But if you only if you add this scheduler.yield first and then you wait for it, you will see that the checkbox instantly appears because the browser is able to update it in, in the time when you call this, right? And you can polyfill this again, pretty much with how we had done it in the first approach, which is just using new promise and using set timeout to resolve it. So again, if you look at MD and also it gives you an example where you show the spinner first, let's say this mounts some CSS spinner, which is animating with CSS, which again, by the way, is not blocked by the main thread. So if you add a debugger on your website, and if there is a, some CSS animation going on, you will see that it does not stop. That also means that CSS animations in browser are performed outside of the main thread. So you start with CSS animation, you call scheduler.yield, and then you do the main thread blocking stuff, right? You also have request animation frame, which sort of like behaves like set timeout. It has a different queue itself. So it's request animation frame RAF queue is it like a different sort of queue at least in browsers as far as I remember this is not available in node.js and finally what you can also do is use web workers which is the best way right if you can just send your task to another JavaScript thread which is like a web worker and then communicate your main thread with this this is the best way to go about. 
Like the author also suggests that if I can do the work off from the main thread, I would choose web worker hands down. Yeah, this is this is a great work. This is a great thing to do if you can do it. Possibly one caveat which I can think of where it would not work is, for example, if you need repeated access to DOM somehow, or if you need APIs which are not available in web workers. So then you cannot do that. If you need a dead simple way to break up tasks, scheduler.yield, again, like a good API where you can just give some breathing room to the browser itself so that it just, you know, is able to every once in a while just update with user interactions and of course set timeout is obviously here for a very long time it has been here since the very start of javascript i believe so it's there in general i'll leave the blog post in the link and the link below that's all for this video do let me know what do you think make sure you like and subscribe thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next video very soon